Anyway. Are we good? I'm allowed to talk now? Okay, what I would like to do this afternoon is go back and fill in a little bit more blanks on these four questions, but do it not not so much directly at these questions, but to look at John chapter 8 um, and, then, and then Ephesians 1 and then have time for some questions and answers. I just want you to see scripturally what I'm talking about, where this is coming from, um, exegetically, but without getting into too far detail. So we're still dealing with the question, who is Jesus? What does this mean? How does this work out? But we'll frame it in a different way. And we'll frame it um, in the light of John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. If someone wants to read those verses for us. Somebody want to read that? Jesus says, if you continue in my word, now that's not a reference to the New Testament. It's a reference to his logos. That's a a reference to our coming to at least suspect that there's something more in us than we knew. He says, if you continue in my word, you continue to hear me, continue to walk with me. If you continue to take those baby steps, then then you're going to be my disciple, my real disciple. Not in that sense over here. What happened to my chairs? We... We've got to have a resurrection of the ogre god just so we can kill it off again. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You're always wanting to add to the Trinity, brother. We are adding to the Trinity. See, I, I love to play golf, and when I get a golf ball that's one, that's for the unity of the Trinity. And I get a golf ball that's for two. That's for the unity of the two natures of Jesus. Three is a trinity. Four is our inclusion. Yeah. So I don't play with five, six, and seven. <laughs> Maybe seven because that's a number of perfections. But um, I do have a lot of five, six, and seven. So uh, where was I? Uh, John chapter 8. And, no, and Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Um, so there's a lot of questions here. One is, what is the truth? What does it mean to know it? One of the criticisms that people often uh, say about me is, well, Baxter's saying everybody's included, they just don't know it. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Because you don't know it means you're trapped in this whole world in, in some or all of its manif- you know, manifold different ways. But knowing in the Bible is not the same thing as knowing in our culture. I mean, knowing in the Bible is profound. It's deep. It's the first time the word know is used in the, in the Bible is when it says in Adam knew Eve. That's, that's that face-to-face thing. That's that mutual interpenetration. That, that whole sexual image is far deeper than just physical. It's about dwelling in. It's about being face-to-face. And so when Jesus says, if you continue to walk in my word, if you continue to hear me or follow the light or give, give yourself to take those baby steps of trust. And it's scary because this, in a, in a way, this whole world seems safe. It may be killing us, but it's safe because everybody thinks this way. And even if you go to different churches or even different religions, in the end, it all comes down that there's a God who's watching you and you've got to get it right. And so somebody's going to tell you what getting it right looks like this week or this year. And if you hang with them long enough, you're going to realize they've changed what they thought was right. So I don't know what that means to how it worked earlier. But anyway, it's something that kind of gives us a sense of being safe here. Safety in numbers, maybe. Misery loves company. I don't know what. But to step out and say, I'm going to walk. With Jesus, and I'm going to take a baby step of, and what we're actually doing in following Jesus is we're saying, Jesus, I am going to agree with you against the way I see things. Because this doesn't make any sense to me. This is like stupid. Like you can't step in faith. What is that? There's nothing. So we're really asking Jesus to help us, and we're asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, help me to take sides with Jesus against the way I see things and against the way things make sense to me. I know enough to know that I could be dead wrong, probably am, so I need some new eyes. But how do you, do you want the Holy Spirit to go, and you get new eyes, but that's not how it works. It's relational. 
It takes baby steps, and those are steps. of. So it's always going to be about risk. It's always going to be kind of scary to take that step and to say what you really see and what you really think and what you really know because maybe this group or this group over here, well, they, they're not going to like this. Jesus is saying this is relational. The way it works is that as you continue to hear my word or see my light or give yourself to me in those little baby ways, you're going to be my real disciples. Because you're saying, Jesus, disciple me through this. I'm blind as a bat. I don't get it. And that's the thing about the fallen mind. The one thing about the fallen mind is it, it our fallen minds is that one thing that we know for sure is that we our way of seeing things is the right way. So even when God disagrees with us, he's wrong. It, it's inconceivable that you can be wrong. So if it makes sense to you, then that's got to be the way it is. This is what the fallen mind and fallen imagination does to us. And Jesus is saying, walk with me and let's take, let's take sides against this and begin to grow. And that's what he's saying. And then you shall come to know the truth. Now, this is John 8, 31 and 32. And you shall come to know the truth. Now, this is already true. We're the ones that are coming to know it. We're not making it true. We don't create this relationship. We don't even create the fact that we're included in this relationship. Jesus is saying that there is something that is true, that is real, that you don't see. And it's big. And it's real big. It includes you. In fact, it includes everybody, and you don't see it. It's sort of like when John the Baptist in John's Gospel is standing in front of the Pharisees, and he says, among you stands one whom you do not know. He's here now. He is the Lord. That's what I've been sent to prepare the way for the Lord. He's here now, and he's standing in your midst, and you don't see him because your way of seeing can't cope with the way he really is. So repentance or the word that translated, uh, the, the Greek word is metanoia in the New Testament. And we translate it repentance. It means a transformation of mind. It means a radical transformation of the way we see things, of what makes sense to us and how we look at them. Beginning with God, then yourself and others and all creation. So we're saying to Jesus, I want to see things the way you see them. I'm going to take some baby steps. You've got to help me because this is scary. And please don't make me do this by myself. That's when you can begin to appreciate people like Francois and Lydia and what they've done in their life is they've taken these steps by themselves largely and then a crowd gathers, but those <laughs> that's scary. And think of the disciples. The disciples are having to stand against their whole tradition. Everybody's whispering about those, those brothers. They've lost their minds. They've been with that Jesus. He's a radical. He's talking about God being his father. Who ever heard of anything like that? I mean, think of this. Jesus, as a human being, comes out of, out of in, in, well, before his ministry, when he's 12 years old, he refers to his father's house. Now, here's my question. Jesus never heard anyone in his entire life and never read any place in the entire Old Testament where anyone ever called God my father. So how did he know to call God my father? And how did he have the nerve to do it when it was considered heresy and they took up stones to stone him because in naming and saying, God is my father, I'm making myself equal to God. That was the accusation. So how did he know how to do that? Because he'd never heard, he never knelt down with Joseph and Joseph says, my father. I mean, this is like, we, we're so close to the New Testament, we don't necessarily see this. I think it's because Jesus had been taking baby steps with the Holy Spirit all along the way. He inherited our world. He entered into our darkness. He entered into our blindness where no one knows the Father. No one calls God Father. No one calls. No one ever called God in the entire Old Testament. Father, my Father. It was never personal. Fifteen references in the entire Old Testament to God as Father. But always, even in those fifteen, it's general. God is the Father of Israel or of the King who represents Israel. Over 100 times in John's Gospel alone, Jesus refers to God as Father. 79 times in the synoptics, 250 times in the entire New Testament, you have reference to God the Father. Now, how did that happen inside of our darkness, inside of this world, except Jesus came and somehow he was able to take baby steps and he began to perceive himself as the Son of God. And that was going to cost him dearly, as it did. 
And he began to see that God not only is father, but is my father, and I'm the exclusive son. And so from a human vantage point, this was, this was not, Jesus didn't have rose-colored Holy Spirit glasses that he just put on and saw the world. He grew in his wisdom and, and stature, like it says in Luke 15, uh, Luke um, 2.52. He grew in wisdom and stature with God and with men. So when Jesus is telling us, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, he's saying this is an incremental process. This is going to take time. You're going to learn to see things a little different, and you're going to walk with it. Because every one of us, this is how good the fallen mind is. This is how good Adam's mind is, or the darkness, or whatever you want to call it. Every one of us can, can make a case for why we are right. Whether it's in the argument we're having with our spouse, whether it's politically, whether it, whatever it is, you are sharp enough and good enough as you can lay out a case that is logically airtight. But you could be wrong. You could be wrong about your husband. You could be wrong about your wife. You could be wrong about your parents. You could be wrong about God. You could be wrong. This is the dilemma. And Jesus is saying, trust me. Walk with me. Let me show you. And you take those baby steps. So then we move from taking baby steps. We begin to know. It begins to be something that we're experiencing. In the Greek tradition, to know is to take a part and examine the parts and to dissect it. It would be like with this chair. To know the chair would be that you take it apart, you look at it, it's made of metal and cloth, there's probably foam rubber in there, something there, it's got screws, and you're, you're able to tell what, what the chair is and what it's made of, and that's considered knowledge. In the Hebrew world, that's not knowledge. What would it mean to know the chair in the Hebrew tradition? Sit in it. You sit in it, you experience what it does to your body. What it's there for. That's, so knowing in the Bible is more about spirit experience than it is about what we would call head knowledge. Always involves the mind. But it's always more than the mind. And this, these, this is a simple verse that we've all learned in Sunday school. We learned in churches. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But knowing is an experiential thing. It takes time. There's a process involved. It's not something you get overnight. And even if you could see it, and I had conversations with several of you during lunches, we've all seen it. What I was saying this morning is not new to anybody in this room. You've seen it, but you couldn't believe it. You saw it, but you couldn't believe it because in our fallen imaginations, it can't be that simple. There has to be more to this. I have to do more. All the things I've been told. And you get that flash and you see it. And for a minute you believe it, but you still don't know it. And so the Spirit is helping us bridge that gap between seeing it and, and experiencing it becoming knowledge. And what Jesus is saying is you're going to know the truth. You're not going to make it true. And please hear this. There is something about you that is true today and in a, a million millennia whether you believe it or not. There is something about you that Jesus has made real, whether you see it today or you see it tomorrow, whether you believe it today or not. We've gotten ourselves trapped in modern America in our, in our evangelical world where we sound a lot like existentialist. We sound a lot like our faith makes it so. Your faith can never make anything so. Jesus made it so. Your faith begins to see it to discern it, to discover it. And you think, I'm, I, I can actually pray to God as my father. Because Jesus has said that's who is, what's true. Can I trust that? Do I want God to be my father? You know, in the shack, Papa says, Mackenzie, I can be the Papa you never had. And it says, Mackenzie said, that was both a warm idea and something that scared him. Because we're not sure we want God to be our father because we're not sure who God is. And this is why the Holy Spirit won't give it to us informationally and let us memorize it and go on about our way. It's not about learning scripture. For it. This is about relationship. It's about knowing. Jesus wants us to see with his eyes so we know, not just believe, but we know who his Father is. That produces trust. That produces courage. That parousia. So we're going to come to know the truth. I love this. It is true. We will see it. We can't even begin to believe it right now. You will never make it true. Jesus is Lord. He is the Father's eternal Son. He has grabbed hold of the human race and included us in his relationship. He did that. He did that without our permission or our vote 
We don't see it, but we will. We have died and our life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, we too will be revealed with him in glory. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God and such we are. But as of yet, we don't know what that means. But we know this. When he appears, we shall see him as he really is. Then we know who we are. That's the truth. Now, I... I'm a theologian. I've spent my life trying to understand these things theologically and explain them. But this is not about theology. Theology is Windex. That's all it is. You either got good Windex or you got bad Windex. But theology is about the Holy Spirit clearing away the eyes of our hearts so that we can see what's real, what Jesus has done. And our hope is not in ourselves or in the quality of our faith or the wonder of our glorious our repentance or our holiness or our obedience. Our, our faith is in Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And he has hold of me and he did that. And can I trust that? Or do I want to go back over here and trust what I can make real by my magic? And very often, a lot of what we do in Christian circles today is really magic. If I chant the right way, it can come into being. You cannot transform the water into wine unless Jesus is doing it. And if he's doing it, he's going to ask you to participate and it will happen. And we, this, is, this is important because if we're not careful, we end up over here where we're trying to make something real and we're crafting it into being by our word. Uh, we can believe that we've done it. But it's not going to last in Jesus' world unless it's something he's doing. And then we participate, and that proceeds on the basis of, I'm going to walk with him. I don't even know what is real, Jesus. I think I'm real. I think this is real. I think we're on the right track, but I don't know. You know, I'm going to walk with you until I get to know the truth. So then the question comes, what then is this truth, and what then is this freedom? Because in many ways, the whole of the scriptures comes down to this. Walk with me, and you're going to come not just to believe, not just to glimpse, not just to have fleeting. You walk with me, you're going to come to know this. Now, I want this to happen today. I will, I'm an I'm a instant grit dude. I want to pour the grits in and put the hot water, and we got it. It doesn't work that way. This is a lifelong process. And the reason it's a lifelong process is because we are blind as bats and stubborn. We're like kindergartners who think we have PhDs and we know it all. And we get a word and we're going to craft this thing into being. And the Holy Spirit will allow us to spend 30 years of our lives trying to implement a vision that we think God gave to us. And God may have given us the vision. But God wasn't giving us the vision to tell us what we need to go create. He was saying, this is what I'm doing. And then we detach that from relationship, go over here and craft this thing into being, drawing all kinds of people with us, families, individuals, maybe whole nations, into this vision. Then we have to sustain it, and then we have to pretend it's real and it's not falling apart, but the whole time this thing is in it, disintegrating from the inside out. And Jesus is saying, you walk with me, you have courage, because you'll get courage when you walk with him, because it's his courage. He's going to, in the passage in Philippians, says, I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. I mean, the text is, I can do all things uh, because Christ is my strength. It's his strength. It's not mine. He shares his strength with me. He puts his life within and says, take a step and let it loose. Take a step and let it loose. And we do that together. That's what's beautiful about what's going on in this room. We do that together. Every one of us walk in the room. I'm blind as bat. I'm not sure what's real. I believe in Jesus. He's going to walk us through. Let's do this together. Let's take baby steps together. When we fall, we pick each other up. It's not about competition. It's not about whose empire looks better. It's about walking together, and, we're, and we know there is a truth. There's something real. It's Jesus. I'm not sure how it works or where it is, but we're going to walk together. <clears throat> I personally wish that we would, we would hang a sign above every church in the United States of America that says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We believe Jesus is the truth, but we don't know how that sets us free yet. Walk with us to find out. <laughs> you know, because we're not experts on how this works out. We're pretty good at arguing with each other, and we're pretty good at condemning each other because you don't have the same interpretation. But who, who's the expert on walking this out? Because isn't that the person or the people you want to hang with? 
the ones who actually can help you know how, how you walk this out and how you get to this freedom. So uh, to me, that's part of the calling of the church today is for us that we don't have to pretend. We're at this place in history where we know Jesus is the truth. Uh, we know that he will set us free. We're going to have to walk this out together to figure out what this looks like. Because we haven't done a very good job so far. I mean, what is it, 40,000 Christian denominations? There's 40,000 different versions of what's freedom? You see, and here's the thing. Now, the think, think with me. If, if we're all included in this relationship, and that's a sense, not an if. Since we're all included in this relationship, since Jesus has found his way and his humility into our darkness, and that means into the pit of your own pain and struggle and your garbage cans, and he's in there as the word, as the music, as the life with the Father and the Son, then is it not the case that we all have a, a radar for that? Isn't that what we're looking for is the full expression of that? And is this not why people today are not interested in the church? I'm not condemning anybody. I'm saying, look, if what we've been given is the Trinitarian life of God, we've got to at least have a sniff for that, at least an orientation so we're drawn to it when we see broken hints of it. And that's all we've got to do. We don't have to argue with anyone. We don't have to lay out a political theory. We don't have to uh, be able to be the best exegetes that can make. What we do is we walk together in the truth because you can't do that without Jesus and without each other. And in order to walk together, you got to confess, I don't know the truth. So we can let it go, Indiana. We don't have to make ourselves look better than everybody else or let ourselves make that our group knows the truth and bless your hearts, you don't know it over here. We can say, no, 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 no. Jesus is the truth and he's going to set us free and we're not ever going to let go till we get that freedom. That's life. It's ours. It's in us. We're not, why would you settle for anything less than the full expression of that in you and in your relationship with your husband and wife and family and friends and one another. Why would you settle for that? Why would you settle for a, a sort of religious version of that over here? It may be safe for the moment, but it's not, gonna, it's not the full thing. I, people ask me about, do I believe in the second blessing? And, I, and I'm like, well... The second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the same. Why would you hold back? We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been given a place in Jesus' anointing in the Holy Spirit. Why are we going to stop with two? Why would we do that? So let's walk together and say we want the third one. We want the fourth one. We, we want to be able to live life in Jesus together. So let's walk that together. And so if we're going to abide in Jesus, we have to stop abiding in ourselves. That means we acknowledge that we're not sure what we know. We're going to want to know the truth in Jesus. And then we're not going to give up. Well, tell you what, you can, you can give up. But you're not going to be able to rest. Because <laughs> the real world in Jesus is inside of you. And you can quit on it. And, and, and I, I've done that. You can try to quit and you can try to be cynical. But you know better. <laughs> because deep, the deepest part of you is Jesus and his Father and the Holy Spirit. And they're not giving up. So we're in this thing for the long haul until we come to freedom. Now, how long is that going to take? I think that's what's beautiful about history, is that the Father, Son, and Spirit say, man, we got all the time you need. You know, you're gonna, you know we want it to happen like this. But he said, no, no, we, we like to do things in, in thousand-year increments. You know, So for the first 2,000 years of the church, we're going to focus on this right here, the no, no part. So how do you bring people to understand that they don't know what they're talking about? How does the Lord bring me to know that I don't know what I'm talking about? It gives me 50 years to live out my theories. <laughs> Everything falls apart. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't even know how to, what to ask when I pray. I'm no longer sure what to ask for or how to ask for it. So th I think the first 2,000 years of Christian church, we've been, history has been focused on this. And I think we're coming back around to this, right here. What then is this truth? Now, biblically, when <clears throat> you ask the question, what is the truth, then we know the truth is Jesus. I mean, don't we all, I am the way, the truth, and the life? 
And part of what I was talking about this morning is the same question. Well, who then is Jesus? He's the Father, Son. He's the one anointed in the Holy Spirit. And he's the creator and sustainer of all things. There's a verse in, the, in John's gospel where I think he takes the, where Jesus takes the entire Bible and he squeezes it together like an accordion and he keeps squeezing and keeps squeezing and one verse comes out. And I think it's his answer and John's answer to this question. What, what then is the truth that to come to know, to sit in and to rest in and to experience produces freedom? That's not, can somebody write a book on 10 steps to freedom? Because then that is me trying to apply an external principle to my behavior to make it look like I'm free. This is freedom that starts in here and cannot be undone. See the difference? This is Jesus. Now we're really good in, in, in America with all of our special effects is that we can make stuff look really free. And it works for a while. Uh, apparently. But that's not what we're talking about here. So what is the truth that when, as we come to know it together, it produces freedom? And that freedom is a freedom to be yourself. But what is this truth? I think the answer to this is in Jesus' words is in John 14, 20. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father. Somebody tell me what the rest of that verse says. You, actually, that's Hebrew for y'all. <laughs> and what's the third part? I. This is difficult for us as Western Christians to even conceive of. The truth that is true before you believe it, before you make it so, before you do anything is right here. Jesus is telling us there will come a day. And day is not like August the 16th. Day is age. Day is moment in, in history. And it's the day of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption and the spirit of truth, there will come a time, there will come a place where you are going to discover the real world. And the real world is that I am in my Father as I have been from all eternity, but you're going to get to see this not in the sense of the second person of the eternal trinity, invisible. You're going to get to see what Stephen saw. He was the first martyr of the church and the first human being on the planet to see it. What did he see when he was being stoned to death? He looked into heaven and he says, I see the glory of God. What do you see? I see Jesus. What does he say? Standing. The Son of Man. Not simply the second person of the Trinity. You're going to see me, Jesus. You're going to see that I have a relationship with the Father. And that not only do I have a relationship with the Father, you're going to get to see that my relationship with my Father is so deep and so beautiful and so rich and so right and so free and so unclouded and so unpretentious and non-hiding. The only way you're going to have to be able to describe this thing is you're going to say Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in Him. Like I've been telling you all along, boys, but you're not ready to see it. But you are going to see this. And you're going to get to see this as truth. And in that moment, you're going to realize that there is no person here in all of these religious worlds, in all of these things that we've invented that have ever had a relationship with my father. It's always been me. I am the one who from all eternity is face to face with the father in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. I am the one who knows the father. And you're going to see me in this relationship. So the first thing about the truth is it has nothing to do with you or me. We didn't make this happen. You can't undo it. There's no power in heaven on earth that can get in and drive a wedge in that relationship. That's been sealed forever in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we're not talking about invisibles here. We're talking about a human being. We're talking about one bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh who ascended and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from whence? 
as the creed says. The human Jesus, the, the Son of God incarnate is faith. We are going to see that. The world is going to see that. Everybody is going to see that. The Holy Spirit is going to make sure that the Holy Spirit does not rest until everybody sees this. Not as a theory, not as a platonic idea, not as a political theory, but as the truth, as the way things really are. Aletheia, truth, is reality. This is why you can have hope, is that Jesus is real, and you can, you can hope in him because he's made this real. We didn't make it real. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough, I've, done, I've worked at this so long, I don't, want to, I don't want to be responsible for making it real or keeping it real. <laughs> But it's so beautiful to see that the first instance, the truth that sets you free and sets everyone in, on earth free has nothing to do with us in the first instance. All eyes away from your religion, away from your wonderful faith, away from your, your commitment, away from your, your, who you are and what you've done or not done, your failures, your strengths, your weakness. And that's got nothing to do with this. Look away from all of that and the first thing you're going to see is that I am in my Father. We're going to see it. Our eyes are not going to be upon ourselves and upon our unworthiness or upon what our parents told us we were or maybe the church or what anybody else tells us we were or what our culture tells us we're worth because we don't drive a Mercedes or we don't live on this part of town. All of our I am not, none of that matters. There is a reality that we are going to see that exists without us, without our vote, without our permission, without our encouragement, without our will, without our strength, without our weakness. In fact, the only thing we've contributed to this process is by murder, as I said. Our contribution was treachery and betrayal and murder. And then, once we steep on that for a good while, and I do believe that's where the Holy Spirit has us right now, is we're beginning to see Jesus in the Father. We're beginning to see this not about us and our works and our, our goodness and our, our you know, strength and our prayers and and I'm not minimizing any of those things. I'm just saying that what's mat what matters is Jesus. That's what matters. Fixing your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of, of our faith. How is Jesus the author of our faith? Well, when you're here and you suddenly have that light dawn and you see Jesus, you got something to believe. Your faith begins to be, well, I'm, I'm beginning to believe in Jesus. I'm beginning to see him. And that's what he says all the way through John's gospel. You're going to believe that I was, my father sent me. You're going to know who I am. You're going to get to see me for who I really am. So we're in here and we're in the dark. And we may be trying to muster up a faith and try to be people who stand up for Jesus. And when you see him, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, the word of what? It doesn't say word of God. It says word of Christ. The news, the reality of Jesus is what creates faith in us. Because you suddenly see something that you could never dare to dream. Who would have ever thought that God would humble himself and become a human being and stay a human being for all eternity? Who would have ever seen or thought to even try to make real by wildest imaginations what Stephen saw? His comfort in dying and being, and being stoned to death was he saw Jesus, his friend, his brother at the Father's right hand. None of these people matter anymore. What's a stone? What's, what's their verdict? Oh, they're going to kick me out of the synagogue. Well, this is the synagogue. How can you kick me out of the synagogue? So, you, you know, faith comes by hearing him by the proclamation of the real Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the one who's with the Father face to face. He's the anointed one. He's the creator and sustainer. He's the one we're going to see who is so close to his Father. It's such a beautiful and profound relationship. The only way we can describe it is never use the word with here. Jesus says, I'm in my Father and the Father is in me. You with me? And he says, once you kind of settle on this for a little while and you park there, for a couple of generations. You park there for a couple of generations. Then you're going to begin to realize there's more to it. That the truth is three dimensional. That while you can focus on Jesus and his relationship with his father. That does not leave us here in what I call the hooray for Jesus model of Christianity. <laughs> well he got there. You know what about the rest of us? 
You know, bless, bless our hearts. Now we've got to imitate him. Now we've got to work our way. We've got to follow the way to Jesus all the way to the Father. Until one day we can get there and we can be in the Father and the Father in us. Jesus is saying to you and to me, he's saying to his disciples, in the context of the upper room, in the context of the impending doom that they feel of his crucifixion, they don't know what's happening. They know it's not going to be good and they're scared to death because they have taken the baby steps and thrown their lot in with Jesus. They got nowhere to go. They've walked away from this and they realize something's fixing to happen here that is not good. And Jesus in the first instance is comforting them and saying, you're going to see something and it's going to help you walk through the sorrows that you're going to see that I'm in my Father. And then he says, and you're going to see that you are not outside but inside. You're going to see that you are in me. That's what faith discovers is real and begins to believe as being true. That's not what we make. This is not about a great column or chasm. That's the old thing that I used to hear. It's a huge chasm. God's here. We're here. We're sent sinners and the chasm's there. And when we pray the prayer or we do whatever, we can walk across the chasm and get to God. Uh, hello. I thought we had this thing called incarnation where God comes across the chasm. And what does he do when he gets here? He comes and gathers us all together, takes us down, lifts us up, and takes us back. And we've got this chasm, so we think that faith is a form of magic or repentance or crystals or charms or, or obedience or whatever particular bent that you come from. But there's something that you do that goes cha-ching, and you get moved from this column to this column. And prior to going through that, you're not included. And prior to going through that, you're not saved. Prior to going through that, you're not reconciled. You're not adopted. You're not justified. You're not some Whoa, 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 whoa. You're going to see that I am in my Father and that you're in me. So whatever we mean by saved, reconciled, justified, adopted, included, whatever those terms mean, they're all gathered together in you're in me. Because there is nothing better or more salvific, or more at one, or more justified than Jesus seated at the right hand of his Father in that face-to-face -face relationship. And you are not outside, you are included. Now, the gospel commands you and summons you to believe it. Boy, like, how do you believe that? How can I possibly believe that I'm included? I gotta, I've got to walk together. We've got to pray with each other. Lord Jesus, help us believe that you're in the Father and that we're in you. We're included. And we did. Can we not celebrate that? Can we not celebrate the fact that he has done this? And now I can look over and see all of these people here and all the people all over the world, and I'm like, they too are in Jesus, in the Father. Oh, there's a political theory there, is it not? There's an environmental theory here, is it not, in the identity of Jesus? There's an anti-denominational theory here. How can I look down on these people who are included in the same life and I'm just saying my blindness is a little bit less than your blindness? This is not liberalism. This is Christianity. Jesus. This is Christ-centeredness. He has included us all and we're going to see that. And as we see that, we're going to treat all these people differently. We're going to treat ourselves differently. First thing that's going to happen in your life and mine is we're going to give ourselves a break. If you grew up in this part of the world, in my part of the world, what you need is a 30-year hug. <laughs> you, need, you need to hang with Jesus for 30 years and do nothing except just accept your acceptance. We don't need to be told to do one more thing. We don't need to be told one more time that we're no good rotten sinners and we deserve to burn in hell for the glorification of divine justice forever and ever. What we need is to see Jesus and his Father in this shocking, stunning, unbelievable, inconceivable idea that I'm included in that and I didn't even do that. And you're asking me now that it's real to vote on it? You're asking me now to believe that, to take a baby step, to walk together and say, can we dare believe this? Could we, can we have a community of people on this planet that actually believe that we're all included and therefore I can't look at you as a, as a black person or a white person or a male or a female? Or somebody from the wrong side of the tracks, or who is his? I see you as someone who is in Jesus with me, and as blind as I am, can no more believe that than I can believe. Let's walk together. This is this is what we're called to believe. This is the witness that we are to bear as Christians in this dark world. Is there is one who has hold of us? His name is Jesus, and you too can hope in Him. Walk with us. We don't know what it looks like yet. 
And we're not going to require of you that you march in a particular way. Because we're supposed to love you and tell you that you're included and we're going to walk that out. And we're going to get, we, next week we'll know a little bit more about it. And then next week, if we keep going, we're going to get to see it more and more. We're going to get to know the truth. Now, how did Jesus make that happen? How did he get hold of you? How did he get hold of me? How did he get hold of the world? How did he do that? Well, I said earlier this morning how he allowed himself, he submitted himself to us. That's not the whole truth in terms of what he was doing. You go back to the question of the identity of Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's the Father's Son. He's the Creator. I mean, he's the one anointed in the Spirit, and he is the Creator of all things. This is John's emphasis in verse 4. All things came into being by him, and not one thing has come into being through. So what's that telling us? I know it's after lunch and it's hard. This is a really important point. What is that telling you about Jesus? He's the creator of all things. It means that he has a relationship with everything in this cosmos. This is not like a child who takes a glass of soap and puts the soap, the wand in and blows the bubbles out and the bubbles float out. The child created the bubbles, blew them into being. But once they detach from the wand, they exist on their own. In fact, the child can destroy the wand and throw the soap bubbles in the, in the garbage can and those bubbles can float along for a little while. You see what I'm saying? That's not what John is saying. He's saying all things have come into being through the word, through Jesus. He's called them into being and he sustains them every moment. So if it's the other way, then he could theoretically go off and die somewhere and the bubbles keep going. That's that deistic thing that we've inherited in our world and we don't even realize it. Um, but John is saying, no, no, he's called, now, he's, he's called us, he's created us, and he's called us into being. Jesus has a relationship with us as a creator and he's called us into being and he has a relationship with us and he sustains us. Okay? Whether we know who he is or not. This is the truth. This is who he is. He sustains us. Now, that's what John says in verse 4 of chapter 1. Paul says the thing, same thing in Colossians chapter 1, in verse 16. Anybody, anybody got a Bible? Read that verse for us. Verse 16. And while you're looking that up, somebody look up Hebrews 1 3. Somebody read Colossians 1 16 out loud. Y'all didn't bring Bibles? New Testament. And then the next verse. He is above, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And you see, what's interesting is, as I find in John, he intuitively knew he had to repeat his point because we weren't going to believe this. So he didn't just say in verse 4, all things came to being through Jesus. He says, apart from him, nothing's coming to be. So when you come to Paul... He's going to go even further. He's not just going to say everything came into being through Jesus. He says whether thrones or dominions or rulers or principalities, he goes into this Hebrew hyperbole so that we realize he's talking about everything here, everything, up, up, everything in the, in the entire creation. And then he says not only has it come into being through Jesus, but he says he is before all things and in him all things hold together. You with me? So he has a relationship with all of creation as the one who called it into being and as the one who constantly sustains it. Such that, as John Calvin says in his commentary on John 1.4, that if Jesus withdrew himself, all of this he, it collapses. Oh, yeah. See, this is where our Jesus has not been quite big enough and where we haven't been faithful to the New Testament, where the Spirit's saying, come on, boys and girls, I want to help you see this again. I want you to see this. Your Jesus is way bigger He's the Father, Son, He's the Creator and Sustainer of all things. Now what I'm trying to help you to see is that Jesus doesn't become a human being in order to have or establish a relationship with us. He already has a relationship with us. He's our Creator and our Sustainer. Now the book of Hebrews says the same thing in, in chapter uh, 1, verse 3. All of this is in the first chapter again, which I personally find very fascinating because it's like 
the way we've talked about it in sermons and hymnology and all this, you would have thought it was a footnote way over here. But it's not. It's center cut first, right here. Father, Son, Anointed One, Creator, and Sustainer. Everything came into being. Not one thing came into being. Everything came into being through Him. Nothing apart from Him. Where the thrones, dominions, prince, invisible, visible, whatever. It's all come into being through Him and is constantly upheld by Him. Such that if He withdrew Himself, the entire creation collapses into non-being. Okay? Now what happens then when this son and creator becomes a human being? Does he divorce his father? Does the Holy Spirit stay back in heaven? You see, so when Jesus steps into human being as a history, he's coming with his father, with the Holy Spirit, and as the one who holds all things together. He already has this relationship. And so now he's going to say, okay, what you as a human race have brought into my world and my relationship with you is a bunch of darkness and confusion and religion and all that dark stuff and anger and bitterness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the relationship that I have with you and I'm now going to earth that relationship in the midst of your pain and rejection and treachery. You see it? So Jesus is going to say, I already have a relationship with you. And I am going to allow you to condemn me to death. And I'm taking my relationship with you. And I am going to burn that, establish that, root that at your very worst. You see that? The humility of Jesus. And I'm going to bring my Father and the Holy Spirit with me. So, here's my, my thesis statement. To speak the name of Jesus Christ, biblically. And in the tradition of the early church, is to say Father, Son. It is to say one anointed in the Holy Spirit. And it is to say creator and sustainer of all things. And therefore, to speak the name of Jesus Christ biblically is to say Trinity and creation and humanity are not separated, but together in relationship. Jesus is the relationship. The crucified, broken humiliated Jesus, the Son of God. He is the relationship. In Him, the Father. In Him, the Holy Spirit. In Him, the Trinitarian life. And every human being and all creation are together. He is the one that has made this real. And so when He died, it wasn't like the Lone Ranger riding off into the sunset. Because if Jesus dies, what happens to creation? It dies. If He rides into the sunset, the sun and the moon and the stars and every person and planet goes with Him. And that's what the apostles are saying happened. He died, we died. He rose, we rose. He went to the Father's right hand, we went to the Father's right hand. And we're over here, well, no, that's too simple. I'm sorry, that's just right, that's heresy. Where'd you get that, man? I've, I've, never, I've never heard anything like that. Therefore, it can't be true. We're going to be embarrassed in a family way. It's not shame. We have underestimated Jesus. The glory of God is the humility of God to come and meet us, to take the relationship that he has with his Father and Holy Spirit and bring it down into our darkness so that we can begin to see it in our darkness and so we can begin to take that baby step in our darkness and say, I'm, I think this is good. I think I'd rather believe in you than believe in me. I think. And we take that step. This is the New Testament's message. This is what's staring us in the face, but we can't see it because of our present, our present blinders. And the Holy Spirit is saying, you're going to see this. You're going to see this because the Holy Spirit says, I'm the one in charge coming to help you. Do you see this? It's already real. You're already included. The world's included. The cosmos. Paul says God has reconciled all things in heaven and on earth. And Paul says he's already preached the gospel to all creation. Because that word with the Father spoken has been speaking. Now if you don't know that as a teacher or as a parent or as a, a preacher, you're in trouble. Because you think you've got to make it happen. But because that word has been spoken to all creation, because it's inside of you and me, because this is the truth, when we talk about it, it's going to resonate. The radar is going to go off. Right. Everybody's mind is going to go, no, can't be, can't be, can't be. Okay, it can't be. But just watch and see what it is. Yeah. It's time. It takes time 
And our job is to keep bearing witness, to keep saying, yep, this is true. And we do it together because we can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. And we do it together and we pray for each other. And we're going to stand, we're going to proclaim this Jesus who's in the Father, and we're included in him. You see it? Jesus is bigger than we ever dared to dream. That's why it's good news. The gospel very often, as it's proclaimed, uh, and has been proclaimed in our culture is not even news. Because news is something you didn't know and you couldn't tell yourself. We've worked out a whole theology that makes perfect sense to us in our darkness. So not only is it not good, it's not even news. Jesus is good news. We didn't see this coming. We never dared to dream of anybody like this. And he's pulled it together so it's news and it's good. He's calling us to say Amen. Which is what faith, amen. All the promises of God to us are yes and amen in Jesus. And by him is our amen to the Father. Amen. You see, we got a place to stand that's beautiful and strong and real and eternal. And as long as the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, as, as, as uh, George MacDonald says, as long as the Father, Son, and Spirit love one another, all is well with the little ones. <laughs> you, you rip this relationship apart and we got a reason to be scared. But we're included in this. So that's not the end of the story. There's another part. Jesus says, once you see me, and I'm in the Father, and I've included you, then you're going to get to see that I'm already in you. Then you're going to get to interpret your whole life in a brand new light. And a light of Jesus that you didn't know was there. Because you've seen yourself this way all your life. And suddenly a light dawns and you begin to see that there's been something at work in me from the inside out long before I knew about it here. Long before I knew about it here. I was wrestling with all this in, in um, Scotland trying to think of what this meant. Because you see something and it's inconceivable. You know, it's like I see it, but how, I, I don't even have a vocabulary or colors to paint this, and you just, you wrestle, you wrestle, you wrestle with it. You think of a poet that sits down that has this idea of a point, and so she starts writing, and she comes up with this metaphor, this image, and, and she wads the paper up, and she throws it on the ground, and she writes another one. That's, that's good. No, that's not. She ends up with a pile of paper, and little by little, a poem begins to emerge, and you stop and look at this process. So, how did the poet know that this metaphor that she wadded up and threw on the ground wasn't right? How did, how did she know it, when it was? Because there's two knowings. One is here, and the other is here. And we're saying that Jesus is saying to this, this is the knowing in the spirit. Now let, it, let your imagination, your mind grow and expand until it's worthy of the theme. Don't try to shrink the theme to the limits of your imagination. Yes. Grow your mind. Grow your imagination. Grow your thinking until it's worthy of the theme. That pro that's the process of our growth in, in, in this whole movement in which we begin to know the truth and are set free by it. Anyway, I was in Scotland back in the late 80s. And my brother was coming over to visit. And we were going to play golf. And I was at the airport. I was sitting down reading the newspaper. And I just happened to notice, for whatever reason, a young man about my age, a little bit older, who was standing in front of the arrivals monitor. This is way before the security issues and all that. And so you actually could pick people up and meet them at the door uh, when they got off the plane. And so this young man was standing over here like this. And he would look over at the arrivals monitor. He'd look back down the car that went out to the plane. And he would look and like this, and then he'd walk over here and he'd look outside. And before long, a plane came and, and landed, a jet did, and it, turned, and it, it taxied up. And, and he backed up, and he was standing about from here to the clock from those double doors. And I was sitting over here reading the paper, and for whatever reason, noticed him in, amongst the hundreds or so people in the room. And I was watching him, and, he was, and those double doors opened up. And people started coming out. Some were in a hurry trying to catch the next flight. Some were just glad to be home. And then the, the man was standing there, and you could see him like, looked at his watch, looked at the monitor again. And then there was a little boy came and stood right in the double doors, and he scanned the crowd like an alarmed deer. 
And his dad said something. I'm thinking he, heard, he shouted his name. I don't know. I think it was. Anyway, I was like, and that dad stepped forward, and that little boy came running across that airport. He dropped his bag. He jumped up and landed in his father's arms, and they embraced like this, and there were tears, and there was laughter, and there were kisses. And I'm sitting there watching this, and I'm getting this ticker tape. Baxter, that is the gospel. That's my son coming from the far country. There's his resurrection. There's his ascension. There's the session. And the good news, he has you and the whole world with him. We will see it. Because it is the truth. It is the way it is. The difference between the Christian community and the world is we're getting to see it a little sooner. And we're called to help them see it. It's not that we're in and they're not. The whole world is included in that. I tell that story everywhere I go. I, I've been to Australia probably 15 times now. I tell it every time I go down there, even when I go back to the same place. And I was telling it one year, and I sat down after the lecture was over, and I heard this girl, her name was Stephanie, and she comes crying down the aisle. She's, Mr. Kruger, Mr. Kruger. And I'm thinking, this is classic. This is what you do when you're shame-based. Oh, man, I did something wrong. <laughs> What did I do that, you know, and she sits beside me in tears and I put my arm around her. I knew her and I said, Stephanie, what's wrong? I said, I thought that was a pretty good lecture. <laughs> Why are you crying? I, mean, I grew up in the Presbyterian church. You just you don't do that. So if you do, somebody died or something's wrong, you know. You should have seen me the first time someone I was talking to have passed out, you know, slain in the spirit. thing. I didn't know what it was. My daughter walks in and says, Dad, there's a dead woman. There's a dead woman. <laughs> and, he, and she said, and they're covering her up. Look, they got blankets on the pews. <laughs> I said, she'll be all right. We'll have a resurrection later. I, I had never, I'd heard about it. I'd seen it on TV, but I'd never, it never happened to me. <laughs> anyway, so Stephanie's crying. And I said, Stephanie, what's wrong? She said, nothing is wrong, Mr. Kruger. She said, when you told the story of the little boy in the airport, the Lord gave me a vision. I said, what did you see? She said, I saw God on a throne, and it was high and lifted up, and there were all these steps that went up to the throne. And there were all these people on the steps trying to get to God, and we were all sad because we couldn't make it. And we had blood on our fingers and our elbows because we were trying to get to God, and we couldn't do it. And I said, did you see anything else? <laughs> she said, then I saw Jesus. I said, oh, and what did Jesus do? She said, he came over and gathered all of us in his arms, walked up the steps and sat down in his father's lap. That's the truth. You and I will see it. We will see it. And then we're going to get to see ourselves in a whole new light. We're going to get to see that Jesus has been in us all along. And that he's the secret of our motherhood. That his relationship with his Father and the Holy Spirit is the secret of our humanity, of our music, of our dancing, of our making bread, of our making salad, of our friendships, of everything that is good on planet Earth has been coming from the Father, Son, and Spirit, been put in us through Jesus, and it's coming to expression. And we keep treat, trying to create this thing over here called the church and, and the sacred place. And I'm, no, no, no. This world belongs to Jesus. It is his world. There is no secular part of this creation. The whole earth is to be full of the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Now we begin to see ourselves a little bit differently. I was in college and um, they had this dude coming to do this uh, special retreat. and He was some big famous preacher from my part of the world. and I went along because there were girls <laughs> There, as every other guy in the room went along too. So we're standing there, sitting there, and he's going to do this great sermon. It's just, he holds up this video. This is long before the DVD days. This is back in the video cassette days, which we thought was like cutting edge, way better than reel to reel. Y'all don't even remember. You don't even know what I'm talking about. Anyway, he holds this thing up and he says, he says, when you die, 
God has, has a recording of everything that you've ever thought, said, did, didn't do. And he, you're going to have to plug that thing in and play it on the big TV screen in the sky in front of your mama and your grandmama and everybody else. And so everybody in that room old, older than 13 was thinking, how, how do you get, how, where's the erase button and how much does that cost? <laughs> so he had us all coming up, you know, I'm sure his numbers went, he got so many saved that night. You know, had us all praying the prayer to get the great eraser in the sky out, please. I've thought about that, over, not only because of the shame and manipulation. Now, that's a long way from what we're talking about here. But then I thought one day, I thought, you know, Jesus, he's not into shame. So what happens when you die is you meet Jesus, and he walks over to you, and he hands you a, a DVD. This is your life in contribution to the kingdom of God. And so then you go into a private room, and you and Jesus sit down, and you plug it into the DVD player and you hit play and the blue screen comes on the TV and you're like, and it just stays blue. <laughs> and all this what about, what about, I mean, I went to Denver, I went to Fort Collins, I've been to Australia, I've been, but what about all these things that I did for you? You know, wait a minute, I mean, I, it has not been blank. You know, I've done something for you. Is there nothing that I get credit for? And about the time we get really angry, Jesus taps us on the shoulder and hands us another one that says, not you, but Christ in you. Yeah. And you get to plug that one in, and then you see your conception from the vantage point of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and you see your giftedness and your burdens and your trials and your tribulations and your hurts all woven in this tapestry of what the Father, Son, and Spirit are doing. You see? You're going to get to see yourself in a whole new light. Not in the light of your darkness and what you believe or what you've been told about yourself, but in the light of Jesus. We're going to see that. We're going to get to interpret ourselves. The church is the place on earth that's supposed to be knowing that right now a little bit so that we can begin to treat people differently. I cannot, I can no longer, as a son of the South, I can no longer look at people as black and white. What I know is they're included with me in Jesus and he is in them. And how can I help that come out rather than how can I squash it? This is what parenting is. Parenting is not making our children conform to our wills. Parenting is discerning how the life of the Trinity is trying to express itself in this child and helping them, encouraging them, disciplining them so that that life is free to flourish. And the community of faith is saying, yes, 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 we do this together because we can't do it alone. The same as pastoral care, same as teaching, is that we recognize no one according to the flesh. We don't recognize anyone according to religion or anything at the socioeconomic level, what country they're from. We recognize people as being in the one who's in the Father and Jesus is in them and is trying to come to expression and we are going to participate with that. And for me, my first thing is, Lord Jesus, please don't let me do anything to hinder it. If I get so far down the road where I can actually help, okay. But I don't want to cause one to stumble. I don't want to be the one that a person gets to the end of their life and they say, I walked away from Jesus years ago because of all of this. Yeah. And they didn't walk away from Jesus. They've been running to him. But how do they know that? How can they possibly see themselves in that light unless this Jesus is proclaimed and unless the community of faith is beginning to walk that way? Not requiring that they, they conform to certain codes or even beliefs that we have, but walking together to say, Jesus is in us. What does that look like? Maybe hospitality. Maybe we ought to recognize hospitality for what... I was in, in uh, mid... mid uh, Kansas, I think, maybe Iowa, some years ago, and I was going to speak at a college, and this young man picked me up, and it was a part of the country that's just flat. There's farms everywhere. And so we're riding down the road, and this, this kid, I think he was a senior in college. So I said, so what are you going to do when you graduate? And he says, I'm going to seminary. And I said, well, are you going to be a missionary? And he said, no, I think I'm going to be a pastor. And about that time, this huge John Deere tractor turned and was plowing the field and turned right in front of us. And I said, well, you see that, that man on the tractor there? And he said, yeah. And I said, have you ever thought about how Jesus relates to, to him and what he does as a farmer? He said, well, no, I never thought about it. I said, well, 
you're probably going to have 60 farmers and their families in your congregation. This is an important question because if you don't know how Jesus relates to their farming, that means you don't know how Jesus relates to what he spends most of his time doing as a human being. I said, this is an important question. He said, well, I see it's important, but I don't know what it means. And so I said, so when you get home tonight and you get your supper ready, what, what are you going to do before you take your first bite? He said, well, I'm going to thank the Lord. I said, well, of course you are, but what are you going to thank him for? He said, for the food. I said, why are you going to thank the Lord for the food that the farmer grew? He said, he said well, you're not saying I don't need to thank the Lord. I said, I said, no, I'm telling you that your prayer knows more than you know how to see. Your prayer knows who the farmer is. That farmer is participating in the gift to you and your family that you're going to thank the Lord for, and you don't have a theology that allows you to see what your prayer already knows. And in fact, you're not going to be able to tell that farmer who he is or relate to him in the kingdom for who he is and his family because you're going to participate. I didn't say this part, but you're going to participate in this recognizing according to the flesh and make him feel and his family feel less than because all they do is farm. And you're going to buy into somebody's definition of greatness, whether it's, it's in medicine or if it's, God forbid, in theology, or, and we're going to work... <laughs> And we're going to buy into that subculture and we're going to work it and we're going to make people around. We're not going to be able to relate to them for who they really are. That man and his family pour their life into participating in the Father, Son, and Spirit's provision for their creation. And they love it. And what we want to do is draw that man off the track and put him over in the Presbyterian subcommittee and get him to do something for God. <laughs> A distant God who's watching us we don't know how to recognize because we're not seeing in the light of Jesus. And there's a, more going on in your life and in mine than we ever dared to dream. Many years ago, the first time I ever flew over the Rocky Mountains, I was going to the Pacific Northwest, I think maybe Oregon. And I had never seen the Rocky Mountains, so I decided I was going to book a seat uh, beside the window, which I did. And as it turned out... And back in those days, the, the plane was half empty, so every middle seat was empty. So everybody had space. And I'm sitting on row 25, and I'm looking out the window. And they close the plane, it backs up, and then it stops, and then it goes forward, and they open it up, and this, this man gets on. He looks like Indiana Jones. He's got the hat, the satchel, the leather jacket. He starts walking down the aisle. I'm thinking, I know where he's going to sit. I know exactly where he's going to sit. 25 rows empty or sitting in the middle seat, and he comes and sits beside me. He introduces him as a systematic microevolutionary biologist. <laughs> he's coming back from a, a, an expedition, a research trip in the Caribbean, where he's very, very concerned about plants. And we get into this conversation, and he starts pulling out his, his, his uh, napkin, and he's diagramming all these species of plants, and he talks about this and that and the other. He knew their Latin names. I mean, it was really seriously fascinating. I mean, this man had a burden for plants. And he, they, he was burdened because we'd already lost whole species to extinction. And here was the group that we were losing if we didn't do anything about it. And so he's going on and on and on. So we're flying, I think by this time, we're probably past Colorado and somewhere over Idaho or whatever. And he looks over at me and he says, so I know you're a theologian. I guess you want to argue with me about evolution. I said, no, I don't care about evolution. But I have a question. He said, what's your question? I said, where did you get your passion for plants? I mean, did you grow up around botanists? Was Uncle Freddie a botanist? Did you just decide one day at a rally that you were going to dedicate your life to plant them? I mean, this is amazing. You're a grown man. You know their Latin names. You care about plants. This, you know their speed. Most people don't even know these plants exist, and you're burdened for them. I said, where did that come from? And he says, well, and we actually said it at the same time as I, just probably just evolved. And I said, and I said, probably not. So I pull out my napkin and I draw three circles for the Father, Son, and Spirit. And I said, I know the origin of your passion for plants. That would be the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's their creation. They're the ones that are passionate about their creation and its blessing and its welfare. And I know who you are. It's Jesus that puts his passion for plants in your heart and you've been tooling around in the Caribbean for two weeks. You've given your whole life into it. You love it and you don't even believe there's a God. And so he looks at me and says, well, if that's true, 
Why haven't I ever been told? And I said, you just were. (laughs) You see, the light shines in the darkness, illuminates what's real, not our interpretation, what's real, and calls us to walk in it. And that man was called to say, yes, you mean I'm not an idiot. You mean to tell me that my love for passion actually comes from the Father, Son, and Spirit? That's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Where, where can I go and, and hear more about that? And that's that Jesus. Where, and I'm, I mean, it's like, wait a minute. That's where we are historically. We're rediscovering the real Jesus. That light is shining. We're beginning to see who we really are, what's going on in our music. It's beautiful to watch when you got a little bit of the eyes to see because you can have a completely, quote, secular moment. Let's say a football game. And this, because even Presbyterians are charismatic in football games. At, <laughs> at certain moments, at certain moments, there's a magnificent play. What does everybody do in the entire stadium? What are they doing? You see, you, you can begin to see it's the glory, it's the life, it's the reality of the Trinity that's being manifest. It's like when somebody sings the national anthem and just takes it and it comes out, and we all recognize its glory. But we don't know what to call it because we don't have eyes to see in Jesus. That's what we're learning. This pastor friend of mine called me one time and he was really, really distraught because a a lady in the congregation, a mother of four, I think, had collapsed and died at the breakfast table. Four young children and her husband. And he said, Baxter, he said, I just... You know, I'm, just, I'm here. I am with this enormous burden within my soul, and the whole congregation is burdened for this family. And I'm just like, where is God? And I'm, well, number one, you're asking why did the Lord allow this to happen? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. I know He's in it for our good if something happens, but I don't know why. I said, but your other question is, where is He now that it has happened? He said, that's it. And I said, and that's an interesting question. Because in order to to ask the question, where is the Lord, you have to assume that this enormous burden that you feel in your congregation feels originates with you. In other words, this is our burden that we're bringing to the Lord to get him to do something. Wait, 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 wait. Maybe it's the good shepherd. Maybe it's the burden of the Father, Son, and Spirit being already shared and these people responding and living it, but because we don't have light, we don't know how to interpret it. And so we don't know how to honor and love and relate to one another. In it. And we're asking, where is God? Which is embarrassing, really, when you look at it the way it is in Jesus. Are you with me? This young mother came into my office one time with a stack of newsletters that thick around Christmas time. And she walked in the mall, she's a good friend of mine, and she walked in and she slammed them down on my desk and they just went scattered. And she says, I feel like a pile of crap. And I said, what happened? What's going on? And she said, well, I've been reading these newsletters and all these people out there are doing these wonderful things for God. And she said, and for Pete's sake, their children are even perfect. And she said, she said, I do three loads of laundry a day. And when I'm not doing the laundry, I'm grocery shopping. When I'm not grocery shopping, I'm cooking the groceries. When I'm not cooking the groceries, I'm cleaning up after cooking the groceries. And and after that, I'm trying to to keep this house presentable so that when my husband comes, he at least wants to come home. And by the time he gets home, I'm too tired to do anything. I can't even read my Bible. What do I have to offer to God? And I said, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. It's one of the few times in my life when the Holy Spirit was on time. Usually the insights come months later. I looked at this young woman and I said, wait, 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 wait. I happen to know just yesterday that you bought a coat for your daughter. And not just any coat, but one that you knew your daughter would love. And one that would be large enough for her to wear next year, but not look like it this year. And as a matter of fact, I recall, you said it was on sale. And she said, yep. I said, and you found it. And she said, yep. And she's looking at me like, what's that got to do with anything? And I said, so my question to you is, did you wake up yesterday morning and take a good mother pill? She said, what are you talking about? I said, did you dedicate yourself to be a good mother? She said, what are you talking about? I said, what I'm saying is that you woke up yesterday with a concern for your daughter. 
And you gave yourself with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength to participate in that. And it was your great joy, and you did it. And so what I'm trying to help you to see is maybe that burden and all of that didn't start with you, but started with the good shepherd who was the one that really cares for your daughter. And he shared that with you, and you've been living in it all day, and you think you're too tired to do anything for God. And these meals that you provide for your family, what if that's the Father, Son, and Spirit preparing a royal feast for their loved ones, but refusing to be Lord without you, because that would be to pretend that you're not included in their relationship. There's more going on here than we ever dared to dream. We're beginning to see it because we're turning again as a people to focus on Jesus and who he is and his Father, and we're included, and that's so real, it's already at work within us, but we don't have eyes to see it. One of the first times I began to see this was, was uh, I was in Scotland. I was sitting, I was studying, uh, working on my, my doctorate way back, and I was sitting in the, the church Sunday morning, and I, I read the word invocation at the top. And I started laughing. And I didn't know what I was laughing about. I, I really, I was like uncontrollable laughter, and I'm like, I'm going to have to leave. I mean, this, <laughs> and I couldn't figure out why I was laughing. I kept thinking, why would you laugh about the word invocation? And I thought, well, then it hit me. The invocation is the prayer for God to come and bless the service. The assumption is we all got up in the morning and out of our own goodwill and heart came here on our own and we're going to offer this on our own. Now we want God to come and bless it. As if Jesus were not in us, we would have ever gotten out of bed. <laughs> this is family embarrassment I'm talking about. If Jesus were not in us, we would be catatonic in the corner and we would never ever do anything. We would never run the risk of any kind of vulnerability whatsoever. The only reason we have any communion, any face-to-face -face fellowship, any risk of love is because that is what's in us. And it's coming out and we're taking these baby steps, but we can't see it because of our religiosity and our framework. And if we're not careful, we're going to take all of this and turn it back into religion again. So we just said, no, no, we're going to walk in this together. And there's more going on in you than you have ever dared to dream. And you are going to get to see it because the Father, Son, and Spirit have given it to you. And this is who you are. And they're determined that you come to know it together with us, all of us, until the whole earth is full of the glory of the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Are you with me? So it's right there in our New Testaments. Jesus says, walk with me, and you're going to get to know something that's true, and you're going to see it, and it's going to set you free. Because when you see that who you really are, then you're free to embrace your motherhood as being your participation in the creation of the triune God. Through your bodies, mothers and grandmothers, has come and will come human beings that once they are born, they will live for millennia and millennia and millennia and millennia, and they will always call you mother. That's just what Jesus has done in you and through you. Now, bless our hearts in the Christian world. We don't know how to honor you for that. We don't know how to, to recognize you according to the glory that you have. And we don't know how to recognize fathers for who they are because they get to participate in that process. And the Lord is so good, he makes the conception part really fun. <laughs> it does. That's a whole other lecture there. All right, it's almost three. Let's, let's take a quick break, come back, and we'll have some questions, and I've got a few final comments to make. Is that good? Thank you.